Okay, so thank you to the Royal Society of Biology to, for inviting me. I was actually invited to come and do this about two years ago, so uh, things might have changed a wee bit. Um, so my name's Catherine Lawrence. I'm from the University of Strathclyde, which is in Glasgow. Um, this is the building that we teach in. Behind me here is the cathedral, and then down the road is straight into the city centre. So I've been asked to talk about career-inspiring undergraduate projects. And this isn't a new thing. So Strathclyde University was founded in 1796 by James Anderson. And his motto was, it's to be a place of useful learning. And useful learning has got to pro provide you with the skills that you need for a career. So this is something that we've always set about doing throughout our courses. So what about what do we teach? So we teach a joint honours programme where students combine two out of the four disciplines of immunology, microbiology, biochemistry and pharmacology. We also have an IBMS accredited degree in biomedical science and students can continue into an integrated masters. One thing you've got to realise in Scotland, we have four year degrees, not three years degrees. So the first year is a foundation year and then they develop on from there. So we really get to know our students really well and we work with them throughout their time with us to help them to think about what career they want to do. So, as you all realise, the project is really that capstone experience. And as the Royal Society of Biology says, it's got to be inquiry-based, with the aims to provide um, the skills to critically interpret data and analyse that, to develop their conclusions and hypothesis, um, to provide knowledge in a key area, and that key area might be something they want to develop their career in, um, and to give students the opportunity to carry out original research. Now, we, as I've said already, are always looking to match a project to that student's career aspirations. So I don't just mean the topic of doing microbiology or immunology or pharmacology, but it's about the skills that they can develop and how that might align to careers in different types of industry. So like all of you, I expect, we offer the traditional laboratory projects, um, which obviously has careers that are in research, industry, or healthcare. We've also strived for students to get some experience about what in vivo biology is, because that's an incredibly important part of the bi of biological research. But we also have been developing other projects. So we do what's called an enterprise or knowledge exchange project, and that's really aimed at students who think of, they'd like a career in business, education projects, uh, science communication, data analysis, bioinformatics, and critical analysis research projects. One of the things that Royal Society of Biology asked us to explain about was how we allocated projects, because I'm sure, like you, you find this a struggle every year to make sure that... Um, students get what they want and you're able to deliver it. So we have about 220, well this year we had about 180 students, sometimes it goes up to 220, and we provide about 10% more project titles than there are students. So say this year we offered 200 different project titles. The staff member will filter it in, in um, from the type of discipline, so is it an immunology or microbiology project, um, what the type of project is, so is it an education project or a, a knowledge exchange project. The student then needs to rank their choice, 1 to 12. And then we stick it into a wonderful algorithm called SPIDER, which will then allocate the projects according to the student's credit-weighted average from the previous year. So what their score was last year. So basically, the top student will get their first choice. The second student will get their top choice, unless it's the top choice of the student above them. So they'll get their second choice, so on and so on and so on, till we get to student number 200. And it works really well. So last year, 63% of students got their first choice. So there's obviously a bit of discussion among students. They know what their rank is. They know what are the popular projects. So the students that are a bit weaker won't choose a popular project. 
and 83% of students got one of their top five. We always get to the bottom where there's about a dozen students that haven't got one of their choices and they're just asked to go and choose from the projects that are remaining. But irrespective of what they're allocated, when it comes to the end of the project, most students said, well, actually, I was really happy with the project. So in the long run, it probably doesn't really make much difference. So what types of projects do we offer? So pre-COVID, we were offering our traditional laboratory projects. This, for the past two years, we haven't been able to offer any because the Scottish government is much more risk averse than the English government. We've only stopped wearing masks last week, so it's a bit of a shock me coming here, not wearing masks anywhere. And the aims of these projects are to develop the, the range of skills for carrying out experimental research. And again, these will align to students' uh, research interests. Our knowledge exchange projects are some things that maybe you guys don't have experience of, but we've got a huge amount of experience. We've been running them for more than 20 years. It's probably more like 25 now. And these were originally developed because the Scottish Funding Council wanted to diversify the types of projects available and to, to uh, include uh, interactions with business. So we have collaborations with companies as far north as Dundee, as far south as Cambridge, and as far west as Air. We don't bother with the east side of the country really too much. Um, but most of these companies are, are within the central belt, and they'll include multinationals like Thermo Fisher, uh, BioReliance, but the vast majority are SMEs. We also do some work with NHS, so that's in collaboration with our uh, uh, people that help us with our biomedical science degree. Um, but we also have quite a few Strathclyde University spin-out companies as well. In these projects, students have to work in a, in a team, so this develops their teamwork skills and interpersonal skills because they're having to work with their customers, their clients, um, to develop basically what is a, a business plan or a market research report. And the companies love this because we're basically giving them a market research report that's worth about £15,000. Uh, students love it because they generally will go on and get a job with that company. So if they, they show that they're, they're good at this, um, then it, it develops those interests, uh, the, those skills. One of the problems with it is confidentiality. So the students and the assessors have to sign uh, uh, data protection to make sure that they're not compromising any IP. But it is a very successful project. Over the last few years, we've been developing education projects with our, our colleagues in the School of Education. And we do this to try and develop resources to help teachers to teach biology. So these resources can be lab kits. So we've developed kits for teaching the, the joys of PCR, which we're all very familiar with now, um, uh, as well as other uh, aspects of the curriculum. And these are really useful for students who are considering that they want to go on and do a PGDE to, get a, to work as a biology teacher. And actually, the students that have done this have said that their experience has really put them head and shoulders above other of our students that haven't done those uh, projects. So that's what that's, those projects are aimed at. Then we have our critical analysis projects. So this is the one that, like you, you probably struggle a bit more for students not to produce a literature review, but actually to do that critical analysis and critical evaluation. So we try to get them to look at data, to look at techniques and methodologies, to understand what the limitations of these are. And these uh, really are proving to be quite beneficial for students in going and getting employment. So one of my students recently, I met her in, in, in the yoga class actually, said, what are you up to now? And she said, I've just got a job with Sartorius as a data analyst. And this is the type of project that she did. So we can see that even these types of projects where you kind of think, well, how is that going to apply for a career in, in uh, the life science industry? They do translate into those careers. And then last but not least is our bioinformatics and data analysis. So our data analysis, what we've been doing over the last couple of years is 
um, where a PhD student has generated data, they'll give it to the undergraduate student to analyze it. So they're getting a feel of what real laboratory data looks like to analyze. And obviously as well, we have bioinformatics data. So people that are doing our microbiology degree, for instance, uh, uh, will be using that kind of data. And that obviously, again, gives all these skills in manipulating and using data. And then we have our science communication data. So we're working again with schools to, to, to develop those skills uh, for, uh, to, to explain some complex scientific concepts. We've also been working with our new partner, which is the Jubilee Hospital in Lanarkshire for health campaign projects. So how can they get some key information out to users? So one of the questions that we got from the Royal Society of Biology was how do the different types of projects make a difference? Do they make a difference to student performance? Is there a difference between performance on those different types of projects? So this is the data that we have. So you can see that our dry projects, which is the critical analysis, data analysis, education and enterprise. And then we have the wet projects, which is our in vivo. We only offer it to a small number of students in laboratory projects. So remember, we do a four year degree. So that's why it says year four and year three. So we compared the CWA of our, the students when they were in year three with their CWA that they came out with in year four. So you can see that if you look along the top line, that there isn't any difference between the different types of projects. So it doesn't matter what type of project the student does, they've all got an equal chance of getting a good degree. What you can see when you look at the bottom line, what they did in year three, that actually doing some of the dry projects, because they're having weekly meetings with a supervisor, really helps them to develop their analytical literature analysis skills, data analysis skills, because they've got the biggest increase in their award. So if you look at critical analysis, they've gone from 57 to 64. And if you look at education, they've gone from 54 to 63. And enterprise, they've gone from 64 to 71. So these types of projects are not hindering students' uh, ability to perform. They're actually enhancing their ability to form. Another question that we had was, how do you assess projects? I'm sure in the same way as you guys, so um, they have to write a thesis, and the thesis is the same format, irrespective of the type of project they're doing. So it's basically got to look like a paper. So it's got to have an introduction, materials and methods, results, discussion. And that's assessed by two independent members of staff, so not the supervisor, so there's no supervisor bias in there. Then they have to give a presentation, and that can either be in the form of a project or a talk, and that's assessed by two staff members, uh, and again, not the supervisor. And last but not least, the supervisor does have a say, and they have to assess their performance. So how good are they at developing their own hypothesis, finding the material, analyzing the data? If they're in the lab, how many times have they uh, thrown the wrong thing down the sink and you've gone to strangle them? So in conclusion, really, are uh, course or this, this class, we call it being a biomolecular scientist, it's not research project, because being a biomolecular scientist isn't all about can you use a pipette, can you design an experiment, you need analytical skills, you need communication skills, you need to have an understanding of the ethics and health and safety, as well as that practical competencies, and of course, working together. And all of those things are things that you require from Royal Society of Biology accreditation. But if you look on the other side here where we have our graduate attributes, these are the graduate attributes that Strathclyde University seeks to promote. So you have to be capable, inquiring, creative, enterprising, ethical, and with a global outlook. So thank you very much for your attention and here at Strathclyde University, we have some values, which are that we're people-oriented, bold, innovative,
collaborative and ambitious, and I hope this demonstrates that that is what uh, our projects are seeking to uh, instill in our graduates. And last but not least is thank you to everybody who helps with the delivery of the program. You're wondering why it's different colours. So the blue ones are the academic members of staff, the orange ones are our technical team, and the green ones are our admin team, none of which we could run our degree program without. Welcome, everybody. Um, Dr. Karen Gary from Nottingham Trent University, and this is uh, Dr. Glenn Kirkham. So I was also invited two years ago, and unfortunately, the pandemic hit. So instead of just having me, you now have a double act. So you are in very much uh, of a good position there, I think. Our talk is about the use of a skills tracker matrix, which we have done for a very long time at Nottingham Trent University, which was designed um, with a lot of input from Dr. Dino De Girolamo. Uh, he couldn't join us today. So we have 11 courses at Nottingham Trent University, um, microbiology, biochemistry, uh, pharmacology, then we have a biological sciences course which splits into four pathways, physiology, pharmacology, biomedical sciences, um, biochemistry, microbiology, and biomedical sciences. And we also have a biomedical sciences course and an applied biomedical sciences course. As you can gather, there's a whole range of different technical skills that students need to be able to do. I've forgotten to say the environmental biology, apologies. Um, so we have done a skills tracker. So all of the skills that any of the students would need to be able to do in the laboratory, in the field, or also behavioral competencies. We have made an, a huge list. So I've, I'm just gonna show you uh, a printout of this. I didn't do enough. I didn't know how many tables there would be. And um, we have seen that students don't often consider their course as a whole. They look at their skills very much in isolation. So we wanted to have a record, a means for them to be able to track what skills they have gathered within laboratory sessions in the field, but also through seminars, workshops, tutorials. We have a very strong tutorial system at Nottingham Trent University. We also have a system where second years and final year students are mentoring first year students. So a lot of behavioral competencies can be reinforced there and there's a lot of communication going on. So we wanted them to not think in isolation, but have a broader picture. Um, we have also included the skills that we track here. They're cross-referenced in any of our laboratory um, guidance, our protocols. And in our guidance sheets for the tutorials, again, we highlight what skills they can acquire in these sessions. So we try and signpost a lot to our students. As you know, and I don't need to tell you this, skills acquisition is a key attribute for employment. We want our students to be ready for employment. So we did not only look at what skills they are acquiring, what is necessary, um, but we include what the employers want as well. What are the graduate attributes that we are looking for? And we put all of these in as well, and then we map it against each of the different modules so that our students can then see. So this is what a first year would look like, where you then can see where do you acquire these. The, these are unfortunately far too big to show you, so that's why I brought some handouts, and then hopefully in the communications we can have a look uh, at those. So, the question was how can we help our students to map and track the skills and then also apply it, have a bigger uh, idea of how does this relate to the employment opportunities. 
So we have designed the um, bioskills tracker. And then I'll pass over to Glenn. So I'm just going to give you some details of the nitty gritty of how the actual skills tracker works. Um, so each student is assigned one of these skills trackers when they begin their course. And it's broken down into different categories, which I'll go on to in a moment. But to try and help the students, we've also done a mapping exercise to identify where they're assessed, so where they've got direct experience with these skills, and also where they may have just have taught experience so they can identify their knowledge and also their skill base. And really, a lot of these are based on the idea that students often struggle when they're looking at job descriptions. If they are particularly transferable skills, they may struggle to think, where did I do that on my course? And particularly if you've got any, an interview question where they're saying, can you give me an example on the course where you did X, Y, and Z? And this is really a way of them identifying it and ticking those things off as they progress through the course. But where I came into this as well is that we've used this in dual purpose. So it's, good, it's a great tool for the students to track their skills, but it's also very useful for us in academic planning to map skills. So I've done with other members of staff some extensive mapping, mapping exercises looking at various different aspects of courses that we offer. And one of the main things we tracked was their skills and the diversity of skills that they're having and also identifying where they are and the num identifying key ones and the number of opportunities that they may have. And this has been incredibly helpful during cover of COVID, which Karen will give you some details on as well. So it's really been invaluable when we um, were trying to identify how to cover our courses. So I'll just go through briefly the categories. I've put a couple of examples, but as you've seen, the lists are extensive. So we've broken it down into a number of principal categories. First and foremost, personal and professional and reflective skills. So these more general skills, and these are the ones that students often fail to identify, that they get experience in on their course. They all can identify whether they did pipetting or whether they did PCR, but those presentation skills or so-called soft skills that we embed in the course, they often have a struggle to identify them, and this document's very helpful for them to do that. Also, general um, lab skills, and we also map in specific skills for each of the courses that we have. So each course has a tailored section so that they can identify the specific skills of their sector. And we've also tried to look at graduate attributes. So of professional societies and things that the field may require of our graduates so that we're really showing the students exactly what we are delivering to them and critically where we're delivering it. Because it's very easy to say to students, you'll get this but linking that to where it is, is, is sometimes a struggle. And as Karen has said, we embed that as part of our tutorial system. We embed it in our course um, leadership and guidance so that the students, as they progress through the degrees, are seeing where they're gaining the skills and also where they're building on their skills. Okay, so how would we use the uh, skills tracker, how are the students introduced to this? So we have welcome week, we get to know them, we form a rapport, and then throughout the, um, so due to COVID, we now have team side, and this is where we um, deposit these skills trackers. They have always been on the course pages as well, but in our experience, students are not necessarily accessing the course pages as much as we would like them to. And we mention it in our regular course meetings with the students as well. So they're introduced very early on, sorry, very early on to, um, to this and what skills they're going to, to learn. So this has been incredibly helpful for our planning with regards to COVID because we have a three-year course. We looked what have the students already done in their first year or second year or third year, well, or will be doing them in their third year. So what have they established? So we looked at each of the different years, what have they got under their belt? Where do they have room for still acquiring additional skills? We also were looking very hard at how can we enrich this further. So we have invested heavily um, into expanding the lobster provision that we have and also learning science. So we have embedded a lot of additional um, 
means for our students. Nottingham Trent University was one of the universities who decided to do on-campus delivery whenever we were allowed by the government to do this. So the students have still had the ability to come into the lab, albeit the restrictions due to, you know, COVID regulations. So we needed to identify which are the essential labs, which skills are lacking that we need to have in. And the skills tracker has been really important for us to look at this as well. Um, in addition, then the skills tracker links to our skills portfolio system. So what this is, is we ask our first years, second years and final years to produce a skills portfolio. They pick one lab um, in the first year and then they pick two labs in the second year and then they have to do five portfolio pieces in the final year as a synoptic assessment where they have to um, identify a job, they have to write a CV, a cover letter, they have to reflect on how they progressed over the duration of the course in their capstone project, uh, in the capstone related uh, portfolio piece. And they have a pro forma, but they can um, personalize this if they wish to. And the skills tracker is really helpful for them to see how have they been introduced to a skill in the first year, how was that improved on, how does it relate across the different modules? How does it link to a job? And it really helps them, this matrix as well, to come to um, see the bigger picture and relate it to a job as well. Um, so we are assessing um, lab skills in the first year. Um, we have uh, identified the pipetting skills, which, which are essential, microscopy, which is absolutely essential, um, and then also more data processing skills, like how to do a graph, um, how to count cells, um, and they need to evidence this in a one-to-one -one observation during a direct assessment session. Um, so the subsequent uh, skills that we have here that we tell our students that they should concentrate on Originally, they were signed off by demonstrators in labs, so they always had to go and sign off. But with uh, an intake of 400 to 450 students, this has been a bit problematic. So we have um, gone to trying to do this more in an indirect manner. However, we've recently had the pleasure of being reaccredited uh, by David and uh, David Lewis. I don't know if he's here as well, and we are trying to consider the challenge of assessing this um, with a larger cohort. So if anybody has a great idea, we'd be very interested to hear this as well. So um, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Um, so I suggest we take questions on the, the projects from Strathclyde first. We have a roving microphone, so if you just pop your hand up and then we can use the microphone. Yeah. Hi. One, one there first, and then the gentleman there. Sorry, you had your hand up? You had your hand up? Um, my, my question is actually to both of you, and it's about the admin resource required, because we are trying to do more with our projects to give students more choice, and we're also trying to increase our practical skills logbook to more of a employability logbook, and, and the the challenge that we have at the moment is who is going to check and keep, keep track of everything. Um, we're a very small university though, so that may be part of the problem, but very happy. Well, we, as, I said in, as I said in my presentation, we use an algorithm to allocate the projects, so actually it's a click of a button, so it takes no time at all. Um, and we have a, a what we call a skills passport, similar to what you're doing at Nottingham Trent. And that is also done through the same platform that we've developed in-house. So it, it's very easy. So the lab skills are basically checked off. We've got a bar scanner that scans it in, <coughs> goes into the straight into the student's uh, PDP, personal development portfolio, and it's part of their skills passport. So it's really quite an easy way to do it. So we don't really use administrators at all. 
But a key thing you're saying is that's something you developed. It's not an yes. off-the-shelf package no. that you bought to do it. Spider. Yeah. Spider. Don't Spider. ask me what it stands for. <laughs> so I suggest maybe you meet over a bit of yeah. a coffee and see what, yeah. how this works. Yeah. Yes. All right. Uh, next question. Yeah, I, I just wonder. Oh, congratulate you on the knowledge uh, exchange project. I thought that was a fascinating idea. What I do find is, and I'm thinking about the balance of uh, students picking these projects, they often go through traditional ones, and that could relate to also the staff expertise. I was thinking particularly of enterprise and education projects. Yeah, there is. The, well, you could see from the numbers there, we, we do have limits on the, the enterprise projects because we work with um, our business manager people, so we can only take 10 students on that. Um, but. With regards to education, science communication, if everybody wanted to put one in, then they can. And it's, it is down to staff expertise. And I would say the biggest difficulty is trying to encourage staff to develop these different types of projects, not the students to take them. And I was just going to make one point. I noticed your project weighting was uh, 60%, which I thought was quite interesting. I was just trying to think about how that works out. I guess a lot of people may think traditionally they put a lot more emphasis on, on the project mark, but I'm just trying to think about maybe future skills development and how uh, capstone project modules evolve and the assessments evolve, perhaps away from more traditional just project writing being yeah. the main emphasis, what, what the future of that is. We're, we're looking at it, but you know, by the time they've got to their final year, they've got, they have developed a lot of those skills along the way. So that probably is reflecting the marks that they get. Uh, one thing we are seeing over the years on the capstone is a number of institutions which are making the project report based on a research paper, not a big thesis. And it was, I've done a visit very recently and it's wonderful to see quite a few students actually got a research publication out of their final year mm -hmm. project. They'd already, they'd already written it in the format that was required for the journal and it was good to go, as it were, which is fantastic for the student, isn't it? Yeah, that's the same approach we had. So we, we used to have a word limit of 10,000 words and we cut it to 5,000. It's quicker to mark, isn't it? It's Can we move on? So I think it also a, was, means it's more concise. I think there was a hand up here first. What was there? Yeah, and then we'll come. Thank you. It was really interesting and I did like the knowledge exchange um, projects as well. But I actually am interested in the algorithm, and I, even though you um, uh, alluded to that, it was a yeah. in-house thing. But do you have any further information? Because I'm sure there are a lot of universities no, out there I which go, would, yeah, that's great. All <laughs> would welcome some help in that yeah, respect no, of sure allocating that. To, uh, the guy that developed it. That'd to, be great. I'll, I'll, I'll find you in the, yeah, in the break. I can show you what it looks like, but for for us, where we put things in, and then how it's all spat out in the end. Thank you. Okay. We'll take this as the last one and then we'll break for our coffee. Um, so similarly, I thought the knowledge exchange enterprise type project superb and we do also do those in Birmingham. And I noticed that one of your graduate attributes that you listed was enterprise. So I'm assuming there are elements of enterprise that are delivered earlier on in the course, which puts those students in a good place for choosing an enterprise project. Is that the case? We try to. We try to. So we, uh, we, we have careers events throughout the time they're with us, and we, we try and get uh, alumni to explain how they've got to where they are in their career in the different types of industries that are out there and what skills that they needed and develop the, the enterprise. But you don't have a formal them. module as such? No, we don't have a formal module yet. Maybe it's something that we can think about doing as we go on to build on that foundation that we've got. Actually, the, uh, the university is developing, oh, now you've asked me, because it's something that we've got to do as a compulsory module in their first year now, which is developing enterprise skills. So it's something, the, the university is very strong in the business side, so to try and encourage that development throughout the process is something that we're all working on. 